Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful that you've brought us this far. So thankful that you are faithful. So thankful for your love and your grace, your mercy. So thankful for opening our eyes to see the, the wonders of your grace. I just ask that you would filter out all of that which is not of you. All of that which is foolish, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the book of 1 Corinthians, verse by verse. And in our last study, we were somewhere in the area of about verse 4, I believe, or verse 5. I want to start out by reminding you of what we read in John 5, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that hears my words and believes on him that sent me, hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life that's a strong negative in the greek not come into condemnation and we're going to see that here in first corinthians chapter one it is not saying that if we hear and believe we will pass from death to life that's not what it says it says we will hear and we will believe only if we have passed from death to life and we're not going to come into condemnation why because we've already passed from death to life it's a perfect tense the verse is stressing the present reality of some past action that's already done completely done i know that is not how that verse is read today uh, that makes eternal life dependent upon hearing and believing which is not what it says so you can't accuse me of departing from the text. All I'm doing is looking at grammar and words. When I go through and I study to do any video or, or, or any presentation of any verse, any chapter, any verse, uh, I'm always looking at grammar and words. I pointed out at the very beginning of this new study here in 1 Corinthians that I'd be talking a little bit more about how I go about reaching the conclusions that I do. So all I'm really doing is I'm going through the text is I'm looking at grammar and I'm looking at words. Word meanings are very important. The grammar is very important. And that's what you have to look at. And we were told to guard ourselves against false teachers. And I think the world is full of them. I'm absolutely persuaded that there are more false prophets, more false teachers of the word of God than there are qualified, real teachers of the Word of God. So, uh, we're going to get into this uh, uh, this section of 1 Corinthians. Uh, we've got a little ways to go just to get through the first chapter. We've got 16 chapters. It's going to take a while. I don't want to get in any hurry. And I don't want to run this to... Uh, uh, too long these videos too long I don't want to uh, bite off more than we can chew but but there is something very dynamic very remarkable about the passes that we're looking at that really takes and lifts lifts you above all of the the uh, what I would say all of the craziness that's going on in the world and I think that if you hang with me here you're gonna find out that you've been given grace upon grace upon grace upon grace and it's amazing to me, dearly beloved, it's amazing to me that God is, is, is going to speak the words that we're going to look at to those who are at Corinth, of all people, uh, who are fleshly and carnal. And I just think that that's remarkable. So we're going to look at these verses. We'll talk about uh, these verses. I'll try to, uh, I will try to, I'm not sure how well my mic is picking up, but we're going to, you may have to adjust your volume a little bit, but we're going to talk about all of this grace. And I think you're going to find this grace quite astounding, quite, quite amazing. 
uh, I know I did. As we know, the, the Corinthians were carnal, they were fleshly, but in Christ Jesus, they are without condemnation. That's the fabulous truth of the grace of God. In Christ Jesus, verses 2 and 3, sanctified in Christ Jesus, called saints, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by or in, depending on how you interpret the word in the Greek there. I believe it's, it's both. It could be both. Translated both ways. In Christ Jesus. Verse 5, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. So, well, I guess there's nothing else. Uh, nothing more for us to learn. How do I come to this passage of Scripture? Twice I've been told that it's in Christ or by Christ. Uh, you know, I'm the way, the truth, the life. You know, we know Christ is the Word. So what is all utterance and all knowledge? I'm going to suggest that it's Scripture. I don't know what conclusion that you reach. I can't believe that any one of you would say, well, the pastor of my church or, 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 or something, you know, he has all utterance and all knowledge. Or Paul had all utterance and all knowledge. Or there were some there at Corinth that had all utterance and all knowledge. And I, that's not what the text says. I can't believe any of you would reach that conclusion. And, and I may be wrong, but I can't believe, I cannot believe that any one of you out there would think that you have all utterance and all knowledge. And yet the text says that at least the Corinthians did. Now maybe, maybe we're making, we're, maybe we're wrong in making an application to us. And I admit that you can say to me, well, Steve, you're acting as though that's also true of us as it was of, of the Corinthians. I'm not acting that way. I'm saying that. I don't think that this is limited to just the people at Corinth. I think the Holy Spirit is, is uttering fabulous truth that is both true of those at Corinth and those at Blessed Hope Forever. So in what way have we been enriched? In what way have we been enriched? You know, in all utterance and all knowledge. It has to be Scripture. Everything, folks, that God wants you to know is in your Bible. If you have a Bible, everything he wants you to say is in, in everything he wants you to think. Everything that he wants you to do is encompassed in that book. It's not just that your sins are forgiven. And in the day of judgment, that there won't be any condemnation come upon you. I mean, that's all true. But in addition to that, he's, he's given you the opportunity, the privilege, to feast upon his word. And I'm personally convinced that from Genesis to Revelation, he completed his word and everything that he wants to tell you is there. All of it is there for reproof, for doctrine, and for correction, for instruction. And I have the privilege of holding it in my hand. You know, it'd be an easy thing to, to spend the, the rest of my time here just making y'all y'all feel guilty because you don't study very much. But I can't do that. Although this book has a, a worth of which you cannot estimate. It's God's word. There isn't anything that you own, folks, that compares to that Bible. There isn't any privilege that you've ever known or any opportunity that you've ever experienced that equals just picking it up and feasting on it. Yet I doubt that it occupies a whole lot of your time. Fifteen minutes of serious Bible study can, can seem like it's like forever, but a two-hour movie goes by fast. 
But folks, I don't want to make you feel guilty, but I know every one of us are tempted to occupy ourselves with other things rather than this book. I believe that the utterance that we have is doctrine, biblical doctrine, yet people don't want doctrine. And I, and I know most of you wouldn't be here if you weren't interested in studying his word. Was this only true of the Corinthians? You know, because they were just super saints. You know, we're soon going to find out in this epistle that they weren't living all that close to the Lord. God's word has enriched you. Uh, if you look at the grammar, that's an aorist passive. It's, it's his word. It's not something that you did. We are taught through God's word. We grow through his word. But the enrichment in the text here is not saying that you enriched yourself by something that you did. I believe that these uh, carnal believers at Corinth were enriched in the sense that they had his word. It's simply a statement of fact that you have been enriched. Verses 6 through 8, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And keep in mind, he's talking to carnal, fleshly Corinthians. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you by the testimony of Christ. Uh, I think that by that it is meant the gospel of Christ, which bears a testimony to his person and his work. You know, who Christ was, what Christ did. It was confirmed and established among these believers at Corinth by the gifts of the Spirit. And particularly, I think, of, of, of prophecy that was bestowed on many of them at the time. They were living confirmations of the gospel that Paul preached. If you look at Hebrews 2.4, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Uh, in Galatians 3.2, uh, received ye the spirit of the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. So even as the testimony about is the word there, as the testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. The word confirm is an interesting word. It means to be established or guaranteed. It's the, it's the same as saying this was guaranteed to you and you have exactly the same word in the eighth verse who also shall confirm you unto the end. The word means guaranteed, established confirmed you know however you want to translate that word i think confirm is a good translation it's a word that means to establish or to guarantee and this to the end all of this is in christ jesus you're not lacking in any spiritual graces the word there is not gift duran in the greek it's charis grace and it's in the plural you're not lacking in any spiritual graces, says the Greek. Well, just a superficial reading of this text shows me that, that's, that it's, it would be hard to say that they're lacking in any spiritual grace. Look at the grace that we're looking at. Look at the grace that, he's, that he's, the Holy Spirit is presenting to these believers at Corinth. We've received grace upon grace. Confirm you to the end. And now we have to decide what the end is, and I believe it means until Christ appears. Note that the King James Version italicizes the words that you may be blameless. The verse says you're not doing the confirming. He'll confirm you unto the end blameless in the day of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. The words uh, that you may be is not there. It goes right to the word blameless. In the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we learned in, in our study in Colossians chapter 1 that it was by the blood of his cross that you are presented holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. 
You know, so many people over the years have said, you know, I, I don't see how I can face Christ. You know, you don't have any idea what I've done. I'm going to be so embarrassed that I'm going to hide. Do we take God at his word or not? Or are you in God's sight blameless? Could it possibly be that these Corinthians before God are blameless until the day of Jesus Christ? I believe that's what the text is saying. And I think that's fabulous. You know, we're all sinners. We know we're sinners, but we also know he forgave us. He paid our debt. We are forgiven and we're blameless until the day of Jesus Christ. Dearly beloved, we are forgiven and we are blameless until he returns. I'm not sanctifying myself. He did that. I'm not making myself a saint. He did that. We're called saints. I mean, when he called me, I was already a saint. I'm not confirming myself. God is. I am not making myself holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. That was done through the blood of his cross. Verse 9. God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that is a verse that, that, that really tugs at your heartstrings. That you were called unto the fellowship of his Son. Jesus Christ our Lord. Keep in mind, this is the Holy Spirit doing the writing here, not Paul. Okay? The heart of God is removing every barrier, every hindrance that would cause these Corinthians, or you, or me, to think that somehow we don't qualify for that blessed fellowship with our Lord Jesus Christ. It is... God's desire that we have fellowship with his son. All of this has a purpose, and that purpose is that we would have fellowship with his son. And note it does not say, by whom you were called unto heaven, or, or by whom you were called unto good works. It, it says, by whom you were called unto fellowship with our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the word waiting means eagerly waiting and that's an interesting word i want to talk about that just a little bit the reason that's such a an interesting word waiting uh, eagerly waiting is is how it reads in the uh interlinear the, the translation there this is a triple compound word okay uh, you don't see a lot of those uh not a whole lot of them it means welcome it's uh it means welcome from and out of. It's, it's a waiting that decisively puts away all that should remain behind. The, the prefix apo, okay, it's, it's apodecami. And so the, the prefix apo intensifies the root of the word decami to emphasize the idea of separation. So apodecami, therefore, is used of looking completely away from this world and to the upcoming redemption of our body. There's eight, eight occurrences of that word that I found. First uh, Peter, uh, it appears in First Peter in Hebrews, but it appears six times uh, in Paul's. Paul uses it six times in Romans, uh, here in First Corinthians, Galatians, and Philippians. It's used of the creation and being delivered from the effects of sin, uh, of believers awaiting deliverance, the redemption of their bodies, and Christ being revealed, and of God eagerly awaiting, the long suffering of God waiting in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared for the eight souls that would be delivered. So in just nine verses we seem to be carried forward by grace from our beginning read it slow go back folks and read this slow it seems to almost have a beginning and an end point you know to the end okay just nine verses from our beginning and being sanctified to being guaranteed confirmed unto the end blameless when he returns 
with an emphasis on God's faithfulness, okay? Not yours, but God's, okay? And so that, why? So that we'll go to heaven? No, no. So that our fellowship at the present time, while we eagerly await our Lord, separated from this world and everything that's in it, okay, we'll be with him. That's what I'm getting from the text. And to be honest, the passage leaves me in a bit of awe of, of just God's wondrous grace. I sense the heart of God reaching out through the text to comfort these Corinthians, to comfort us, you and me, by grace in the most dynamic way, one of the most dynamic sections I've ever seen in all of the Bible, so that our fellowship will be with Christ, who is our Redeemer, as well as our Deliverer. I just, I don't know hardly how to put it into words, but if you... I wrote down a kind of a summary here from the beginning to the end. Paul called an apostle. He didn't call himself sanctified. We didn't sanctify ourselves. Called saints. We didn't make ourselves saints. We've received grace and peace. We give thanks for God's grace in, 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 in one another. We were enriched in him in all utterance and all knowledge. That's the Word of God. The testimony of Christ was confirmed in us. We're eagerly awaiting Christ. We'll be confirmed to the end, presented blameless, just as Colossians says, that God is faithful, that He will do this, and it's because we were called unto fellowship with Christ. Where in the world, folks, could you ever how in the world could you ever read through this and drop your head in despair and be despondent over any circumstance in your life that God allows for your good? I've, I don't, I'll admit, I have read through this, these first, this opening introduction, these first eight, nine verses uh, before. I've never seen it. Uh, appear as dynamically as I have now it's it's just been a true blessing to me I hope it is to you I hope you're having a wonderful Sunday uh, I hope you have a blessed new week I love you all I truly do until next time this is Steve thanks for watching